Hello to all my queers and dears, and welcome to the November 2023 monthly video essay. This month, we're going to be remastering my June 2023 video essay, where I explored how the Marvel Cinematic Universe may have impacted American culture and politics through its decade-plus-long chokehold on the stories we enjoy. Before we begin, it's important to give some content warnings, because we will be covering some very difficult topics. This video includes discussions of bigotry, World War II, nuclear bombing, extremism, terrorism, transphobia, death, and mass shootings. Without further ado, let's dig in. Adam Myers presents Marvel Studios and the Molding of American Minds, Remastered. Edited by Kevin Douglas and Adam Myers. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. Even if you don't watch it, I'm sure you know of it. It is, at least according to the box office, the most successful franchise of all time. While things have changed a bit in recent years, for over a decade, Disney and Marvel Studios had mastered the consistent creation of crowd-pleasers, regularly putting out films that alienated as few demographics as possible while sweeping us up in hype and hijacking our attention for a few hours of mindless fun. Before I get into the rest of the video, I would like to make something clear. I am not against escapism or spectacle films. In fact, up until a certain point in 2021, right around when Eternals came out and the pandemic was going on so I didn't feel safe enough to go and see it, I kept up with all the new MCU content. I was on the hype train as much as anyone, and even after letting go of the MCU and Star Wars, I indulge in plenty of spectacle and escapism myself. I'm not going to stand here and tell you you're stupid for enjoying popcorn flicks or demand you only watch experimental in the art house pieces, because in a vacuum, they're a harmless fun distraction for a few hours. The issue is, nothing exists in a vacuum. The idea that the most dominant stories in Western culture don't impact what Western culture is simply because they're escapist is, frankly, naive. Marvel Studios commanded our attention for over a decade. It's changed the priorities of how Hollywood tries to make a profit as much as the invention of streaming technologies. It's constantly talked about and discussed even when a new one isn't even out yet. There's an actual cultural pressure to keep up with it, a true fear of missing out. Or, if you're a content creator on a platform like YouTube, there might even be a financial pressure because talking about Marvel films or shows gets the most traction from viewers. The MCU became so important to Western audiences that there has been an entire narrative crafted around Martin Scorsese, painting him as an out-of-touch old man basically yelling at young people to get off his lawn waxing poetic about the old days, despite him actually having some really good and important points about the state of cinema and franchise filmmaking. Of course, if you want Marvel films to be considered cinema, you have to be ready to accept that cinema is regularly analyzed from a critical perspective. If that's not up your alley, this isn't the video for you. This will be an analysis of the messages present within the films and shows, absent of the intent the filmmakers may or may not have had. This is not about what they might have tried to put in their stories, but about what was there in the final product regardless of intent. I will be looking at the MCU with the explicit belief that it has negatively impacted Western culture's ideas of masculinity, morality, and the concept of heroism itself, specifically within the United States, where I am located, with the problem being not so much the character's choices and actions, so much as it is that most, if not all, of the story is chosen to be told within one of the most culturally influential franchises of all time, are stories that explicitly make those actions justifiable. Enhanced, of course, by the power fantasy nature of a franchise such as that of the MCU. Be warned as I discuss this below that I'm coming at this from a politically leftist perspective, and I will be discussing American politics in these films from that angle. There are, admittedly, films in this franchise that attempt to challenge the issues I'll raise but efforts to do so tend to have their integrity eroded by crowd-pleasing strategies that make them go down easier. One of these strategies that the MCU is chock-full of 
is a technique called lampshading, which basically allows any kind of behavior to exist unchallenged in the story because the story acknowledges it. One big example of this is the who's worthy of Mjolnir scene in Age of Ultron. It's acknowledged within the film as essentially a dick measuring scene. Oh, this is gonna be beautiful. Clint, you've had a tough week. We won't hold it against you if you can't get it up. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore appears to be acceptable to include without requiring any meaningful lessons or critique because they are in on the joke. Lampshading is inherently playing both sides. The MCU's lampshading usually comes in the form of its humor. The other thing is that because of the Marvel Studios formula, it's almost always reasonable to reduce whatever intelligence the story has presented to a big, violent, usually third act fight scene designed to protect the status quo. Black Panther attempted to do something else, but T'Challa's new approach to ruling doesn't seem to have had any real lasting impacts on the state of racial justice in the MCU. As I said before, Marvel Studios primarily chooses to tell stories in which all of the problematic messages that I discussed below are seemingly justifiable. And that is a problem. As I think you'll see, the issues are far too prevalent to be counteracted by a few stories challenging them, especially if those few stories exist within a wider franchise of over 40 entries and counting. And who knows, maybe my complaints will be addressed going forward. It's impossible to say, but even if they are, I believe the damage has already been done. Oh, and if I say anything insensitive or otherwise harmful to a background that you are a part of in this video, please let me know in the comments. I absolutely want to learn. I want you to picture a character that is a major part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's a willful, stoic, Heavily muscular man with a deep belief in what people need. Willing to fight for it no matter who stands in his way, because he believes with all his heart and soul that it is the right thing to do, and consequences be damned. Even if people tell him what he's doing would do more harm than good, and do everything they can to stop him, he believes in his mission and he will see it to its end. He believes that it must be done to make the world a better place, and so he won't stop until he's done it. Whatever it takes. Am I talking about Thanos or Steve Rogers? I believe that Captain America is at the core of the MCU's problematic messaging. And if you want to watch a deeper dive into his issues specifically, I highly recommend Pillar of Garbage's video on Captain America and American Exceptionalism, which I will link to in the description. Check out the comments too, because there's some absolutely fascinating perspectives in them. Anyway, that doesn't mean we won't go beyond Steve in this essay. Far from it. He's just a really good place to start. Steve Rogers is the epitome of the Western conception of a capital M man. Startlingly attractive, charismatic, physically powerful, respected, unflinchingly certain, and largely unemotional, save for some solemn looks, and, of course, anger. Steve believes in sacrifice for a worthy cause, whether it be life, morals, mental health, etc., he believes in freedom, most of all, but he also tends to like being the one who gets to decide what freedom is in any given situation, and by extension, which sacrifices are okay, when, and for who. We see a good example of his belief in sacrificing what he thinks is needed to sacrifice in The Avengers after Coulson's death. Indeed. Why? For believing? For taking on Loki alone. He was doing his job. <laughs> he was out of his league. You should have waited. You should have... Sometimes there isn't a way out, Tony. Right. I've heard that before. Is this the first time you lost a soldier? We are not soldiers. Steve is pretty callous, talking about how it was his job and asking Tony if it's the first time he ever lost a soldier. He had very little compassion for Coulson's sacrifice. And he seemed to think that Tony's more emotional reaction was unreasonable or at least a bit of an overreaction. Of course, neither of them is thinking about lives lost beyond Coulson, and that's an issue as well. I mean, does the loss of human life matter or not? He remains stoic and unemotional, and refocuses on stopping Loki as soon as he can. 
We see this again in The Winter Soldier, where he waves away Fury's point about his hypocrisy by saying they compromised so people could be free. For once, we're way ahead of the curve. By holding a gun to everyone on Earth and calling it protection. You know, I read those SSR files. Greatest Generation? You guys did some nasty stuff. Yeah. We compromised. Sometimes in ways that made us not sleep so well. But we did it so that people could be free. This isn't freedom. This is fear. It's easy to look back on World War II the way Marvel Studios does. To think of it as a time of easily definable good guys and bad guys. To think that back then America was the greatest country in the world, with power and integrity and a desire to do what's right. But we set off two nuclear bombs in Japan back then, and those bombs killed hundreds of thousands of people, way more than just the guilty. Whether we like to think about it or not, we killed innocents in our effort to beat the bad guys. Whether it was necessary or not simply isn't the point. What the point is, is that being on the right side of history doesn't mean you can't do or support terrible, terrible things. Fighting evil doesn't mean we are immune to committing atrocities ourselves, and those atrocities should be remembered as atrocities, whether one believes they were necessary or not. Cruelty towards our fellow humans, especially innocent life, is always a tragedy, regardless of whether we feel confident in justifying it. In war, no one is truly good. Everyone has blood on their hands. But Steve Rogers doesn't really think about that nuance. He believes doing terrible things in the name of freedom, whatever he believes that to be, is not only necessary, but right. The thing is, as my friend Mechas Gamma, who I'll link to in the description, said to me once, necessary evil is still a form of evil. Project Insight is terrifying and needed to be shut down, but Steve pointing that out shouldn't automatically mean what he did was any better. The thing is, we haven't seen what he did, what he compromised on. If we had, we may have had a different opinion on how pure Steve's heart really is. Huh. Funny. That's very close to how America treats its own history. We don't like to look at the parts that make us question our role in it. Anyways, we then see that arrogance once more in Infinity War, when he doesn't allow Vision to make the choice to sacrifice himself, but Bruce steps in and says Vision might have a choice in a way Steve didn't back in the first Avenger. Although... The only reason Steve didn't have a choice in that film is because he forgot about the autopilot Red Skull had switched on a few minutes before. But even with that potential solution in play, Vision continues to push for his sacrifice because it is a way to guarantee stopping Thanos before he even gets to Earth. Steve, on the other hand, says the Avengers don't trade lives. But in order to not trade Vision's life, T'Challa must sound out legions of his people to die at the hands of Thanos' army. See, once again, is choosing whose freedom must be defended, here, Vision's freedom to live, and what sacrifices should be made in the service of that. This is fine if it's understood in the text as Cap's decision coming from wanting to save his friend, but we don't trade lives as framed as an ideological line Cap has, when really it isn't anything of the sort. Vision even points out this hypocrisy, of course, but... It's dismissed quite quickly, and T'Challa all too eagerly does what Cap asked of him. Now I know, it's Thanos, right? Who's to say they wouldn't have to fight anyway? But this is what we have to work with. I can't make an analysis of what-ifs and what-abouts. What was presented was that if they killed Vision, if they destroyed the Mind Stone, they'd stop Thanos. And Steve asked T'Challa to sacrifice his country so they could do the opposite of anything Vision was advocating for. Like I said above, all I'm doing is analyzing the messages we're presented with, and asking the impact that they had on us. This decision makes sense in the story. That is not in question. They had to try and stop Thanos. However, just because the story was well done, that doesn't mean it couldn't have had a negative impact on us as the viewers. After all, this may have been T'Challa's decision, but 
What's conveyed to the audience is that he's doing it because Steve specifically asked, reinforcing the idea that Steve is the kind of man who was so fundamentally good that even the king of a foreign nation would sacrifice his country as a favor, and it would be the noblest end in history. Finally, in Avengers Endgame, Tony makes it back to Earth, now heavily traumatized and practically on his deathbed. Steve decides that this would be a good time to grill him for information on Thanos. He sacrifices empathy, any potential processing of the collective trauma they just endured, and general common sense to find Thanos and get revenge. Everyone else pretty much stands by and lets it happen. Even Rhodey, Tony's best friend, only steps in because he doesn't want Tony to overextend himself. In the next bit, I want to talk about the frankly stupid idea that admitting you're wrong is an unreasonable expression of vulnerability for men, usually to the point that you must physically assert your dominance to prove you are as right as you think you are. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on Captain America's Civil War. And she said compromise where you can. But where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye and say no. You move. To put it another way, even if the whole world is telling you you might be wrong, you have a duty to shut them out and never wonder if they might have a point. The thing is, no one is a sheep for considering they might be wrong or that someone else might know better. It's not a form of weakness. Yet here, Steve Rogers holds tight to the idea that, that he and the Avengers are above not only U.S. law, but the law of 117 countries. I'm not saying the Sokovia Accords are the perfect solution. They are not, but they could be amended. Tony even says so. So, for instance, I'm sure they could have worked something into the Accords to make sure the Avengers could act without panel permission in an emergency. If Captain America can split the team apart with his sheer refusal to budge, he definitely could have made sure the Accords were more than a political tool. And it seems like Steve didn't hear the first line of Peggy's quote. And she said, compromise where you can. Peggy appears to have understood that you can't just stomp your feet and say no every time you hear something you don't like. But that's what Steve does all throughout Civil War. Plus, a life philosophy for a woman in the 1940s to cope with a discriminatory environment built to disempower her definitely doesn't apply equally to the most beloved and respected man on the planet who thinks he shouldn't be held accountable. It's comparing apples to oranges. You probably think, after everything I've said, that I thought Tony was right in Civil War, right? Well, no. <laughs> I am on no one's side in this film. Everyone screws up. The only reason I'm less harsh on Tony here is because the audience is already primed to recognize that he isn't always right. I mean, he made Ultron, for crying out loud, we know his impulses can be wrong. He also spends the whole film trying to make sure that things are as good for everyone as possible. Or, almost the whole film. But even though Tony does some seriously questionable things in this film, He's also trying his absolute best. He offers to get Bucky help, to amend the Accords, to generally solve all of the issues Steve has. That said, he could also throw some of that money he has to the places who suffered from the aftermath of Avengers battles, the same way he threw it to all those MIT students. He's not that great a guy. On the other side, when Steve hears that Wanda has been confined to stay in what is essentially a mansion, he disregards everything else Tony has offered. Now, look, I don't think Tony handled the whole Wanda thing right. I think he screwed that up. But Steve isn't even trying to think about how to solve the problem they're facing. He believes that oversight will prohibit the Avengers from stopping the bad guys. But what's more is that he appears to think that accepting oversight is the Avengers not taking responsibility for their actions. He literally says so. 
If we can't accept limitations, we're boundaryless. We're no better than the bad guys. Tony, if someone dies on your watch, you don't give up. Who said we're giving up? We are for not taking responsibility for our actions. This document just shifts the blame. I'm sorry, Steve, that, that is dangerously arrogant. Considering oversight is explicitly a tool for accountability, even if it's not always used that way, dismissing it outright is the definition of not accepting responsibility for your actions. I'm sure some of you are wondering why I have such a problem with Stephen Civil War. Many people see the film as a criticism or at least light critique of him. And you're right to a point. Specifically, to this exact point. I mean, hell, by the end of the film, Tony was breaking the Accords himself to go help Cap. Even if you find this film satisfying in the way it handled everything, and unlike me, you feel it didn't take a side by the end, it's undeniable that the MCU as a whole did. Going forward, the Sokovia Accords are simply not a factor. She-Hulk has confirmed that they're essentially no longer in play, and even when brought up in Infinity War, the conversation serves mainly to once and for all dismiss them, with Rhodey, who made it clear at the end of Civil War that he didn't regret what side he chose, becoming the mouthpiece with which to do so. I would love to judge Civil War on its own. Frankly, it's got a lot of issues as a standalone film as well, but by the nature of the MCU, it is hard to do that in an analysis of the wider messages in the franchise. No, the fact is, the Sokovia Accords didn't stick. And outside those who wrote them in the first place, even the staunchest supporters of them changed their minds. It's made clear that despite any consequences to his actions, Captain America was right to oppose oversight of the Avengers. And what's more, he was right to not even consider whether he was wrong. All in the name of freedom, or so he says. The idea of true masculinity as represented in the MCU is that, for the ideal man, inflicting violence on a deserving target is preferable to showing vulnerability. The capital M man is always on mission, for if masculinity involves violence, then the MCU's take on healthy masculinity is to aim that violence at said deserving target. He doesn't grieve for long, he doesn't self-reflect, he cries maybe a single tear on rare occasions. Because any more than that would get in the way of taking it all out on someone who deserves it. Iron Man 3 arguably came closest to honestly depicting a superhero with undramatized mental health struggles via Tony's panic attacks. They were very real, very honest, and made a lot of sense in the aftermath of the Avengers. We also saw a very real portrayal of how some people deal with trauma, throwing themselves into something they know and are comfortable with, so that they can feel some semblance of control over their life. There's a lot of very sincere struggles in Tony Stark in that film in a way that we don't often get. From what I've heard, even Moon Knight couldn't stop itself from Hollywoodizing D.I.A.D. a bit. Shame, then, he stopped having those panic attacks when he went on a violent revenge spree. He maimed and or killed dozens of people, and his panic attacks miraculously disappeared. He also called his new young friend a pussy for having trauma about his dad leaving, which is classic toxic masculinity, and one of the post credit scenes turned Tony getting into therapy into a joke. Sure, Tony seems to still have trauma related to Avengers 1 in the following movies, but those lead directly to violence as well. It's a shame because we were so close to a superhero that showed the consequences of extreme violence as a lifestyle. We even got a hint of what we could have gotten in Endgame with his life with Pepper. But overall, his mental health struggles just weren't as important as his capacity for violence. Do I even have to talk about the mishandling of Thor? Similarly to Tony, he came so close to showing us the consequences of dwelling in vengeance, despite the fact that vengeance is ultimately empty and unfulfilling. Calling the heroes the Avengers has issues of its own, I know that at least couldn't be changed, but it could have been interrogated. Then his PTSD, depression, alcoholism, and all the other consequences of living a life of empty revenge were the butt of the joke for practically all of Endgame. Once he got everyone back and killed Thanos again, though, he seemed fine. At the end of Endgame, he 
seemed all good, ready to abandon his people and go gallivanting around the galaxy while emasculating Peter Quill to show his confidence returning. Once again, embracing those toxic traits of violence and other assertions of dominance equals healing for men, because they get to reassert their manhood, and thus, any honest depictions of mental health issues become incompatible with their new state. I am aware that Love and Thunder had Thor showing mercy to Gore and adopting a child, through which it explores some healthier masculinity. And I also know that Thor and the Guardians parted ways rather quickly, so the toxic dynamics on that ship were pretty quickly moved on from. I am glad of both of these developments. However, I also know that Chris Hemsworth became so ripped for Love and Thunder, his own wife found it gross, and that return to pure muscle for Thor does tie his fatness to his depression and validates much of the comedy made at his expense in Endgame. There is a clear desire to reassert his masculinity in Love and Thunder through these decisions, and that should not be ignored, nor should the harm that Endgame caused through its own creative decisions. Hulk is a very odd beast, no pun intended, when it comes to masculinity, thanks to his time as both Bruce and Hulk exhibiting very different forms of it. But, as Thor says in Ragnarok, Banner is useless in a fight. No, I don't even like the Hulk. He's all uh, like, a smash, smash. I, I prefer you. Thanks. But if I'm being honest, when it comes to fighting evil beings, he is very powerful and useful. Yeah, Banner's powerful and useful too. Is he though? Which is a skill we know is one of the qualifiers for manliness in this world. And especially a qualifier for heroism. Bruce is great with science, and that's useful in these films, sure, but he can't be a part of the climax with all that emotional payoff unless he's fighting. Infinity War could have established Bruce's worth without the Hulk, but he just spends the whole film trying to get Hulk to come out and fight, until the end when he just straight up gets in a Hulk buster so he can be just as violent as the Hulk without turning into him. And that's not even getting into how thoroughly the films ignore his trauma concerning the Hulk. Bruce struggles with this so much he tried to kill himself. But he doesn't have a choice. To be worth putting in the films, he needs to be able to fight, so he has to keep transforming into Hulk no matter how much he struggles because of it. Natasha literally pushes him off a cliff because she needs the Hulk. Banner's desires be damned, and Bruce does the same thing to himself in Ragnarok, and it's played as a joke, despite believing that he might never be Bruce again if he transforms even once more. Then, once we have Bruce's mind in Hulk's body, becoming someone who doesn't enjoy violence despite being capable of it, he too becomes the butt of the joke. He is handled a bit better in She-Hulk, thankfully, actually showcasing what he's learned that let him heal and integrate his Bruce and Hulk sides, but boy, I wish we got more of that. Over in Black Panther, which I'd call one of the best depictions of heroism in the MCU, thanks to T'Challa actually taking Killmonger's points seriously, Killmonger gets to be king because he proves himself to be more physically capable and more willing to kill than T'Challa. Now, Black Panther also directly questions the validity of tradition, so there's a bit of flexibility in whether we are supposed to accept this as a valid approach, but it is honored in the film. Killmonger had the right to be king because he was more willing to kill, and even though T'Challa had people who remained loyal to him because he was a better fit, he still had to prove his physical dominance over Killmonger to reassert his place on the throne thanks to the Marvel formula of ending in a third act fight scene. And I see this in our world. I see it that even when men are allowed to be more emotional, we struggle to let them fully out of the box of toxic masculinity. Men are still not believed as abuse victims or that they're sexually assaulted or coerced. And I was just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, and then he reacted like that and, and I pretended it didn't happen. And they were like, hey man, what are you doing? You could be sued for that. And I got very scared. Uh, and then I said, um, tell anyone and you're fired. <laughs> so... They're still shamed or mistrusted when they express vulnerability. And most of all, we still believe that violence, aggression, and anger are their, our, default nature. 
that men are biologically programmed to be predators, abusers, and that even their protection of others will naturally express itself as violence and aggression. I'm a lot more afraid walking alone at night than I used to be, and there's a lot more places I just won't go by myself. But on the other hand, I do now enjoy being able to walk down the street at night without other people acting afraid of me. I think a lot of feminists have failed to imagine the ways that being treated as invisible or dangerous can also kind of suck. In our progress towards equality, we are even telling stories that show women embracing the traits that are so harmful to men. There's a flawed assumption that that will help our culture progress. Obviously, there are many things someone like me will get by default that we must provide to others equally. But I worry we are, perhaps here and there, attempting to normalize women embodying everything that makes men a problem, and thus continuing to demonize or undermine the importance of traits like compassion, kindness, processing emotions, and other traits Western culture has somehow decided are feminine rather than human. This misandry, these assumptions about the base nature of men, damage all of us. But they destroy young boys. They are what make boys feel like shooting their classmates is how to prove their worth. Not to mention it also affects trans women by assuming that the only reason someone born into a male body would enter a space for girls is to take advantage of them. Frankly, I'd even argue that the far-right narrative that LGBTQIA plus folks are groomers is, while not caused by it, exacerbated by the belief that men are pre-programmed to be violent, to be dominant, and even to be predators, and thus that any man who breaks out of the toxic male gender norms we demand of them must be lying in order to have an opportunity to exhibit those traits so any queer man immediately registers as an active threat. If we want to improve American culture, we need to do more than protect victims of terrible men. We need to completely change what we believe men should be and can be. We've started condemning toxic masculinity, but we haven't yet begun to truly validate men, in particular straight men, but also men as a whole, being anything else such as embracing so-called feminine traits like being emotional or sensitive, especially not without the presumption that they are abandoning their heterosexuality, something men are taught to value. I think because of that, a lot of men feel trapped. Please check out the channel Swolsom and Jesse Gender's video on her experience with masculinity for a start into more in-depth breakdowns on masculinity under patriarchy. I'm aware that some more recent MCU projects, and specifically Disney Plus shows, have been dealing a bit more with some of these topics, especially mental health. However, as I said before, I believe the damage has already been done, thanks to more than a decade of everything I just talked about, and since Marvel Studios is first and foremost expected to include action, something like that mental health element simply cannot stand on its own. Being a Marvel Studios production means spectacle and violence are required as well. With perhaps a single exception being the Loki show, thanks to the brain over brawn nature of Loki as a character. I don't know how much of our ability to wrestle with that was delayed by the chokehold Marvel films have had on the kinds of narratives people get fed, but I can't imagine watching hundreds of thousands of people cheer on aggressively heterosexual, hot, often shirtless men with godlike bodies as they callously kill people while cracking jokes has had a positive impact on said ability to do so. You're not going to put me in a prison. You're not going to put any of us in a prison. You know why? Because you need us. Yes, the world is a vulnerable place. And yes, we help make it that way. But we're also the ones best qualified to defend it. Needing something or someone is an inherently justifying framework. You need that thing, you need that person. So whatever it takes to secure them for yourself appears at least on the surface, to be justifiable. Cruelty, violence, evading consequences. Within that context, 
a lot of people are going to say that they're all okay. And those are the stories that Marvel Studios tends to tell. The Avengers are needed, so they are too valuable for any long-term restrictions on their power. After all, if they aren't there to stop evil, evil will prevail. Mind you, the concept of need is often used both in-universe and in our world, and service of a refusal to look for other solutions. Anyways, let's talk about that evil that the Avengers are so needed to defend us against. Sure, there's evil that's just, you know, evil because why not, right? Evil because that's their nature. Obadiah Stain, anyone in Hydra, Ego, Hela, Ronan, Malekith, Aldrich Killian, Yellowjacket, Kaikelius, and even to a lesser extent Loki, during Phase 1 at least. They all fit within that easily definable moral binary. Loki's whole character arc even depends on villainous impulses being his inherent nature, and then learning to break out of that. Well, at least he gets the chance though, right? I mean, most of the other people the Avengers face just get killed by them. Mercy? Few of them have heard of it, it seems. But it's the other evil that I really want to talk about. The so-called sympathetic villain, or the villains with a point. Because, more often than not, their motivation? It's got something to do with positions that are held on the American political left. Ultron believed the Avengers protected the status quo, which they do. He believed that humanity's strict adherence to that status quo would doom us. If we're not careful, it might. You want to protect the world, but you don't want it to change. What was his solution? Well, just an extinction-level event, naturally. He must be stopped. Vulture believed the wealthy are taking advantage of the lower classes, which they are. To maintain quality of life, he had to become, essentially, an arms dealer. Selling weapons to criminals is wrong. How do you think your buddy Stark paid for that power? Those people up there, the rich and the powerful, they do whatever they want. Guys like us, we build their roads and we fight all their wars and everything. They don't care about us. We have to pick up after them. We have to eat their table scraps. He's not going to go out of his way to kill anyone, but he's plenty fine if a ton of people die because of him, and he will kill people himself now and then. He must be stopped. Killmonger believes black people are suffering all over the world, which they are, and that Wakanda could use their vast wealth and resources to help, which they could. What was his plan? To wage war on the rest of the world and install Wakanda as the new superpower to rule over everyone else. He must be stopped. Thanos believed that there are finite resources, and people will die if we don't do something to make sure everyone gets what they need to live a good life. What's his solution to help everyone? When we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. Universe-wide multi-genocide. He must be stopped. The Flag Smashers. They want to help everyone. They want to make sure everyone has food and shelter and can generally live a good life. You've had six months' worth of supplies just sat there in that building. Don't you understand? We're fighting for our lives. How is this accomplished? Well, they escalate to terrorism, naturally. They must be stopped. It's made pretty clear that despite their sympathetic motivations, these kinds of villains really are just as evil at their core as the others. They don't really care about the causes they claim to fight for, they just want an excuse to kill people and cause destruction. Even if they cared once, at some point they stopped, and now they just use it as an excuse. None of this would be so bad if the so-called heroes seemed to actually care about dealing with the points that the villains make. They don't, though. Villains that use these leftist ideas as an excuse for their villainy are the only source of true leftist ideas in the MCU. They're the only ones who advocate for real lasting change. Vision, brought to life as a kind of anti-Ultron, becomes an Avenger. Pretty solid debunking of any of Ultron's points about necessary change to the status quo or that the Avengers might be more of a problem than they want to believe. But hey, at least T'Challa bought some buildings and was trying to do some good. Shame we don't really see any of it come to fruition, though, because you'd think maybe we would have seen some of that in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. 
you know, considering they're using Wakanda's incredible power to help black people, and Sam Wilson is black, and so is his family, and they all had major struggles directly relating to race, you know, and Wakanda was also an active part of that story. Eh, well. Um, and of course, Tony funded Spider-Man, but hasn't ever really seemed to help out Peter Parker a whole lot. He definitely doesn't care about any other working class folks, and Peter doesn't really ask him to. Apparently, he didn't even leave any money for the Avengers after he was gone, leaving people like Sam and his family to struggle to even repair a boat. The closest we have to anyone caring about the resources problem is some in-universe Thanos was white graffiti and a mug with the same phrase, which is really not the same. And Sam gives a lecture to some politicians that seemingly just had a couple blind spots, I guess. And after that speech points them in the right direction, and now that Isaiah Bradley is a footnote in the Steve Rogers Museum, we could talk about solving the problems that Carly- Oh wait, nope. Show's over. Well, maybe in Captain America 4, in X number of years, we'll see someone caring about all the people dying in the aftermath of the blip because they aren't being prioritized. Or maybe not. Only the villains truly, deeply care about these kinds of ideas, and they only care about it to the point of how it justifies their actions. And look, that is exactly what the right thinks the left is. We don't really want kids to grow up safe and loved. We want to indoctrinate them and force them to hate their country and themselves. We talk about helping people, but all we really want is to hurt people and to take things away from them. In comparison, how could those trying to stop us not be the heroes? So to stop the world from falling into the wrong hands, we need to put it in the right hands, right? We can't trust the government, we can't trust those who advocate for lasting change, so who can we trust? Well. The real Americans, of course. Those who stand up to anyone threatening the status quo. Real men, like Steve Rogers, or good-hearted members of the 1% like Tony Stark, or warriors like Thor or Hulk who can wield raw destruction for the greater good. Even Carol Danvers, who completely disrupted Greek society because of its unfairness, was part of the American Air Force. We must trust these men and the occasional woman who represent true American values, like freedom and righteousness, and who have the physical might to take down anyone who tries to stop them from spreading that real American justice throughout the world, or, you know, the universe. The good guys are always true Americans, or allied with true Americans. Even T'Challa, literal king of a foreign nation, readily does favors for a walking American flag. But a foreigner who doesn't ally with true Americans, they're inevitably the bad guys. Natasha was a bad guy before she worked for the US-based S.H.I.E.L.D. and then the equally US-based Avengers. Wanda and Pietro were villains before they joined Cap, Tony, and the rest. Nat and Wanda even abandoned their foreign accents. Zemo was a clear-cut bad guy before he teamed up with Sam and Bucky. Now he's a bit more gray. And if we extend the concept of foreigner outward into the stars and into extraterrestrial cultures, many alien races are threats or at least antagonists before they side with the people who represent America and its culture. All of the Guardians of the Galaxy were antagonists before they teamed up with the American man-child Peter Quill, who got them all super invested in American music, film, and so on. Not as much of a true American like Steve Rogers, but definitely a spreader of American culture. And as stated, Captain Marvel was literally a military official. There are some Americans who are the bad guys, of course, but many of them are... Well, let's see. Obadiah Stane wants to keep selling weapons to evil foreigners. Aldrix Killian directly associated himself with the imagery of the foreign terrorist organization the Ten Rings. Alexander Peace was Hydra, and therefore associated with Nazi Germany, and used the Russian program Super Soldier for his plans. Killmonger explicitly wanted to be less American and more Wakandan, and Justin Hammer teamed up with a Russian dude. Look, I'm not saying there's no exceptions, but it's definitely a pattern. 
These people who fight for the values of a mythical old America, supposedly before everything got complicated and messy, back when we were heroes, they seem to be the ones we are meant to think we can trust with unlimited power. They're needed to fight off those who pretend to care, and who only advocate for change to cover up for their sinister goals. They need to be able to circumvent any regulations or checks and balances, because when they don't, even more people die. Now, clearly, putting unlimited power in the hands of a few trustworthy individuals who could obliterate threats with their massive resources and or raw physical might as needed is the only way to maintain a safe world, and any accountability efforts would get in the way of that. They may not be perfect, but according to the MCU, they're better than any legitimately elected officials. The MCU is never explicitly overt about this, naturally, but I maintain it's an implicit pattern. Perhaps an unavoidable one, but as I said before, I am not critiquing these films with the intent of offering alternatives. That would be a completely different video. I am analyzing the impact they may have had on Western and specifically North American culture. Perhaps if we had taken their impact seriously years ago, we could have figured out how they could have done something differently. But over a decade in, the damage is done. The best we can do is understand what happened and evaluate what to do going forward. What does it mean to be a hero? That's a complicated question, and one that I'm sure nearly everyone on Earth will have a different answer for. Unfortunately, it's also one that Marvel Studios seemed for a very long time to be almost allergic to even asking. Remarkably, they actually did, in the text itself, a few years ago. You call him a hero no matter what he does? It means that when you choose to spend your life trying to help people, there are going to be things that you lose. When you face the kind of threats that he has, there's going to be collateral damage. My sister is gone because of him. Except the, the thing is that Kate is right, or at least the show thinks so. We're obviously supposed to root for Clint to get home to his family for Christmas. We're supposed to forgive Clint. I mean... After all, he hasn't really done anything the Avengers hadn't done themselves, right? And he went out and killed bad guys? I guess he had a little more angry motivations, but it wasn't that different. Plus, like Kate said, he saved the world, and... I mean, Elena is just straight up wrong about Clint being at fault for Natasha's death, right? And we know that, so... Intrinsically, for the audience, her points and her, her anger are null and void. Clint is an Avenger. He saved the world. The people he killed, the lives he may have ruined, none of that matters as much as those unchangeable facts. As Kate says, with the threats the Avengers face, there's going to be collateral damage. Let me ask you, if you lived in that world, and the Avengers were fighting around you, and you lost your mother, or father, or sibling, or child, or best friend, and the Avengers didn't even stop to see if they were okay, or at least try and make reparations after the battle, would you just forgive them? Wouldn't you think it would be fair to want more than being asked to be grateful there aren't more people dead? How would it feel if someone said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few? And someone you loved was one of the few they deemed a regrettable but unavoidable piece of collateral damage. Some of you may have even experienced something similar during the pandemic. Which, by the way, isn't over as much as people want to believe it is. Wear your masks, people. Heroism, I'd say is directly connected to an intersection between various traits often assumed to be traditionally masculine. Whether they should be or not is a different, albeit related, conversation. These traits are bravery, strength, and a desire to protect, and other sorts of traits like that, as well as a strong sense of morality, naturally. As such, 
the way that you depict masculinity and morality will inform what it means to be a hero in your story. We've now talked about both at length. Not every instance in the MCU reinforces the issues I've cited, I'm fully aware, but I hope I've done a good job showing the recurring patterns and messages, because we are dealing with some harsh truths about some of the most beloved characters of the last decade and a half. The Avengers, in stories written, directed, and produced almost solely by Americans, take American culture and values across the world and act with an authority no one gave them to enforce a worldview more often than not without nuance or mercy. Though thankfully, at least some of that appears to be changing. Even so, how might Americans respond if a superpowered team from a different country did the same to us? Wanda and Pietro in Age of Ultron give us a hint, perhaps. And at least according to that film, we'd see them as villains or at least misguided souls, easily manipulated to help facilitate monstrous acts, right up until and unless they begin to follow our lead. And even within that often nuanceless, merciless worldview, the heroes of the MCU seem to agree fully on one thing and one thing only. Violence. They work as a sound unit, as long as they have a target they can beat up, maim, and likely kill together. As soon as they actually talk about what they believe in or what they actually think is right or wrong, they devolve into fighting with each other usually with arguments turning physical, and not just during civil war either. Their mental health, their compassion, and often their relationships must inevitably come last, because what comes first is almost always fulfilling their violent duty. So, what does this all mean? Well, I see Tony in the way we look at and treat billionaires, what they spend their money on, their impact on our culture, what we allow them to get away with, etc. I see Steve in the way we look at our politics, a, a craving for a charismatic man of action to stand against the corrupt forces and never back down, no matter how many people say he's wrong, a man who will silence those who stand against him and won't ever admit defeat. I see Thor in the way that we treat men and what we praise them for and what we shame them for where the resolution to conflicts often includes strong communication as a last resort, and violence, force, or the threat of it as a first impulse. I see the MCU in our reluctance to embrace true accountability and change, particularly when it comes to the powerful, who seem to want us to blindly trust that they have our best interests at heart. These problems were here before Marvel films and shows were to American culture what they are now, of course, obviously, and many are indeed trying to move us beyond them now. But I believe that the cultural dominance of Marvel Studios postponed our ability to deal with them because it fed these issues, it glorified them, and even gave them to heroes. And not just heroes, but power fantasies. The MCU's dominance and its power in, at the very least, American culture, I believe, shifted many, many, many years ago from harmless escapist power fantasy to validation for violent impulses against threats to the status quo. What is a hero? In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I believe that the majority of the time, they are simply power, given character, and the willingness, and perhaps even desire, to enforce that power on a clear and deserving target. Anything else seems to be flexible, but if you're not power, or you don't have that willingness or desire, you will be subject to ridicule, humiliation, emasculation, or outright rejection from the very idea of heroism. After all, Steve may have been supposedly born with the traits that made him ideal for the super soldier serum, but he wasn't really a hero until he could pair that up with physical might. In the MCU, it seems that the most important trait for a hero is to be a power fantasy. After all, that's what the Marvel Studios formula requires, and 
I believe that not only doesn't do our culture any favors, but has had an active negative impact over the years. So, what can we do? I don't have all the answers, but I can offer some of my thoughts. First of all, get off the hype train. Ask questions, bring critical thinking to Marvel Studios productions, or for that matter, any stories that you watch or read or enjoy in any manner. And ask yourself that regardless of what they're trying to say, which is important, but is not the only important factor, what are they actually saying? What are they really saying? Do they have a bias? Who gets to be a hero? And are they actually answering the questions they bring up? Or are you maybe giving praise where it hasn't been earned because of your excitement? Or maybe even to people like Feige when perhaps someone else deserves the credit? Well, perhaps letting him off the hook for anything you don't like? Don't let Hollywood or a fear of missing out decide anything for you. Or convince you that thinking critically would somehow create a less rich experience. Ask questions of the Marvel Cinematic Universe itself. Of the business practices of its leadership. Of yourself and everything else involved. Second, engage with other stories and encourage fellow friends and fans to do the same. Stories that ask real questions about these topics and provide you with alternative ideas on them and topics like them. You don't have to drop the works of Marvel Studios like I have, but don't let your main source of context for anything the MCU includes in its films or shows be the MCU. Plus, you get to support other kinds of stories, which, whoa, we really need that. And third, actively work to counter any harmful messages that you recognize in the MCU, or any other media for that matter. Tell your own stories with different messages, or just straight up different kinds of stories. Help others internalize that behavior like crying is not only natural but healthy. Promote the validity of therapy and making it accessible to all. Help destigmatize common things like mental health and larger body types. Have conversations about all the stuff I said here with others. Champion the deconstruction of gender norms and expectations like those the MCU indulges in, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of ways to counter the message that the MCU has championed, as well as to counter its chokehold on entertainment. But the first step to anything is to be aware of it, and I hope that I have been able to provide that for you. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. This video is sure to rub someone the wrong way, but it's really not meant to be simply contrarian, so I do hope you'll engage with me civilly. Thank you so much to everyone who has made it this far. Huge thanks to Kevin Douglas, who edited the majority of the original version of this video. Couldn't have done this without you. Thanks to everyone in my incredible Discord community, Adam Plays a Host, who have all supported my video essayist journey. With luck, I hope to put out one video essay like this a month. So if you want to see the next one, make sure to subscribe to catch it when it comes out. Other than that, leave a like if you liked the video, dislike it if you didn't, give your thoughts in the comments, give me feedback, or hell, just comment some gibberish for the algorithm, and I'll see you all soon.